Okay, hi, welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matt Brown. And today we're going to be talking about Thomas Kuhn on paradigms and revolutions. Now, Thomas Kuhn's an interesting figure um, through his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He's probably the most uh, influential 20th century philosopher of science, um, had influence well beyond just the reaches of philosophy. Um, uh, and, and sort of the history and philosophy of science, which is a field in some ways that he founded. Um, Kuhn uh, himself is an interesting figure in that he uh, was trained as a physicist, um, but never, uh, never really taught or worked as a physicist. He uh, worked as a historian of science for many years, um, but then his, his main work, um, or at least a, a major part of his work, the work that he's well known for, um, is considered philosophy of science, even though he was never trained as a philosopher. Um, uh, his ideas are interesting, original, uh, powerful, um, uh, and also uh, have been disputed by, by many, many thinkers. Um, and what Kuhn does that was somewhat original, unique for the time, is he insists that we think about the nature of science in a, a, a naturalistic way, that we base our thinking about science in history, um, uh, in, in the historical evidence, and uh, also um, in our knowledge of psychology and, and other fields like that. Now, um, Kuhn begins his famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, with this thought. History, if viewed as a repository for more than anecdote or chronology, could produce a decisive transformation in the image of science by which we are now possessed. So let's talk for a moment about images of science. Um, there is uh, what we might call the old image of science. Um, uh, and this image might uh, be something you see in philosophers of science. It might be something that uh, you see also among scientists and the general public, how they think about how science works. And according to the old image, um, uh, science is a rule-governed activity. Science seeks the truth. That's the main aim of science. Um, and scientific progress is understood as, as cumulative, uh, linear, and rational, right? Through the scientific method, scientists progressively add more and more to our store of knowledge. That's sort of the, the image of science that Kuhn thinks is not defensible in the context of, of history. Looking at the history of science, Kuhn articulates then a new image. So what's the new image of science that, that um, Kuhn thinks we're going to uh, be transformed by? Right? Well, on the one hand, uh, according to this image, science is a practice that is learned by example. Um, on, the other, uh, you know, on the other hand, science seeks successful problem solving uh, or puzzle solving rather than truth per se. Uh, and then scientific progress is is nonlinear. It's not uh, a, a progress, a, a process of steady accumulation, but it's an alternation between relatively steady uh, and stable periods uh, of the growth of knowledge and revolutionary periods. Um, so Kuhn gives us a dynamic picture of science, how science works, um, that looks a little bit something like this. Science begins in a kind of pre-paradigmatic period, right? Uh, or or proto-science or pre-normal science, he might call it, in which um, the the scientists the science itself has not really um, come up with a st stable framework. Scientists um, are constantly debating the fundamentals of the field. Uh, and each scientist has to kind of invent everything uh, in the field from the ground up, right? Um, the main mode of communication in pre-paradigm science are sort of long treatises, book-length treatises, um, and uh, very little reliance on the work of previous scientists. Eventually, uh, if their work is successful, uh, pre-paradigmatic scientists will uh, come to consensus around a paradigm, 
a particular result or set of scientific results, a way of doing things that is exemplary, that is provides a model uh, for future research, right? Um, so, you know, uh, Newton's Principia, Aristotle's Physics, Ptolemy's Almagest, um, Darwin's Origin of Species, all provide paradigms um, uh, of, of scientific achievement and explanation of um, theoretical and empirical success that lead to a practice of normal science, which primarily is attempting to work on the plan of the paradigm, to extend the type of solutions the paradigm provides to new areas, to articulate it further in more detail with more precision. Uh, and, and for some period of time, this goes well. Um, knowledge accumulates and grows um, based on the, uh, the, the plan that the paradigm presents. But in the course of normal science, um, uh, anomalies start to accumulate. Um, intractable problems, phenomena that don't uh, easily um, submit to the methods uh, that the paradigm prescribes. Uh, uh, events that the theory cannot explain. And if these anomalies accumulate to a great enough degree uh, and the practitioners in the community see the anomalies as significant to the work of the paradigm, a sense of crisis arises, right? A kind of, if you will, lack of faith in the paradigm uh, to, to continue to guide uh, research and if the if the crisis is not immediately or very quickly resolved, then um, this will lead to a scientific revolution, right? And what happens in the in a scientific revolution is that you return to something not unlike the pre paradigm state. It's not exactly the same as the pre paradigm state, but um, what you do have is you have debate about fundamental issues. Um, and you have many now competing paradigms arising as alternative candidates for how to continue to work, um, how to continue to do science in this field um, in, in order to address the anomalies. Um, and as the revolution proceeds, um, one, uh, one paradigm will typically get more adherence, it will become sort of better articulated than the others, it will have more success, um, and it will grow and eventually replace the old paradigm and kick off a new period of normal science. And so it's a fully kind of cyclical, um, cyclical account of the dynamics of science and and um, Kuhn purports to trace this dynamic throughout the history. Now, according to this uh, this account, the new sort of image of science and the sort of historical philosophical account of the dynamics of scientific change, um, there's a number of interesting questions that we can ask. Right, um, we can ask if if this is how it works. Right then how should scientists be trained? And one of the really interesting things I think about the first uh, essay that you read, The Function of Dogma in Scientific Research, um, he really attempts to explain the form of traditional science pedagogy, um, science education, based on what is necessary for scientific training in a, in a, in a normal science situation. Um, we can also ask, I think, um, whether paradigms can be compared. Um, if a paradigm is, if, if, if the revolutionary movement from one paradigm to another is not a matter of steady accumulation of knowledge, but instead is a, a, a rather significant shift in the nature of the practice, then we can ask, um, you know, can that, can that, um, can the two paradigms pre and post revolution be compared to see which is better in some sense? Um, and Kuhn has some surprisingly uh, negative things to say about this question, I think. Um, and we can also ask, are, are the revolutions rational? Do they make progress? Is the replacement of one paradigm by another a, 
a form of progress or not, right? Um, and, and we can ask, does science get closer to the truth over time? These are some of the questions that this kind of um, radically revolutionary picture of science uh, can, can raise for us. So those are some of the things I'd like you to think about uh, going into our discussions today. Um, if you have thoughts about that, please uh, make a note on the Discord, um, uh, bring it up in class, or make a comment here on the video. Um, also, you can uh, respond to some of the discussion bo board posts that have been uh, posted. Some really interesting stuff there as well. So I look forward to discussing this material with you, and uh, uh, otherwise I'll see you next week.